Janet, please take it away. Um, actually, I think Joe is going to start out, right? Okay, then Joe, please yeah. take it away. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give a, you know, sort of a brief intro. So hello, everyone. My name is Joe Ansley. I'm the team lead for visit analysis here at the ALCF. Um, so Janet's got control of the slide, so I'll ask her to advance. Right, so I just want to, to you know, sort of set some expectations up front. Um, so we're, you know, we're working on, you know, as you know, we retired Cooley, our uh, production visualization resource that we've had in production for the last eight years or something obscene like that. Um, and so it retired at the end of the year. And so we're moving all of our Viz workflows over to Polaris. And so today's um, webinar is all about um, primarily um, giving some some high level overviews of, of running the visualization tools that you might be accustomed to running on Cooley. Now doing that on Polaris, the it's largely the same, but there's some minor differences, including it's a different scheduler and things like that. So, um, uh, so it's it's largely going to be about you know launching these things interactively, um, show a little bit about how to run them in batch, uh, provide there'll be lots of, of places where we provide pointers to additional resources. Um, our intention is sort of to initially just sort of just run through um our slides and and some of the stuff that we're um going to present and we may do a little bit of of demonstrating versus slides we'll we'll see how that goes as we go but but our intent is to get through that relatively quickly and then have plenty of time at at the end for hands-on for people to try and actually do um the stuff that we're that we've shown um and you know with with opportunities for us to help you um also, just to, to kind of clear and what some what we're not planning to do is really give, you know, like an overview of different types of representations uh, that you can use when you're using these tools or give an in-depth tutorial on specific Viz tools. We do have resources um, available for those, and there will be some pointers at the end, I believe, where we've done some... Um, uh, Right. We've given presentations similar to that before, like at APPESC and other um, uh, ALCF events. And so a lot of those are recorded. And so those recordings are out there. You can go look at them and we'll provide pointers. Um, we're not going to go into details about compiling specific tools, that sort of thing. Um, so just so everyone's kind of on the same page. And um, so next slide. So a little more detail about we, what we we plan to do right so there's two primary tools um, that we use a lot visit and pair view and so we'll, we'll go over those things on you know, a little bit of an overview of, of them uh, very brief and then how to launch them on on polaris um, and then we'll go a little bit more in depth with pair view in terms of showing some um, uh, some examples of, of of how to script it and actually running things in batch um, and then we'll also cover a little bit of uh, image magic, which is a tool for doing like annotation and combining images and things like that. Um, right. And and a lot of times the end goal is to to generate a movie, right? And so we'll show some again some scripting of how to loop through a bunch of of time steps in pair of view and and save off, you know, some frames, and then. Uh, run a script with image magic to annotate, um, add some additional content to those images. And then FFmpeg is an encoder that we use to um, combine those stacks of images into movie files that we can play. And so, again, we'll, we'll try and get through most of this relatively quick um, and then have plenty of time for hands on and questions uh, sort of in the second half. And so, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, to Janet, and she can tell more about some of these recording sessions, you know, point, about these pointers and sort of jump into the next steps. All right, now I'm unmuted. Um, hello, so my, I'm Janet Knowles, and I'm going to just talk very briefly about connecting um, Visit with, with Polaris. So um, as most of you know, Visit is a um, software visualization tool that we use. Um, quite a bit and 
It's an open source interactive scalable visualization animation analysis tool. Um, so going through visit on um, Polaris. So right now, um, 3.4 is actually on the visit website. So if you want to download that, um, right now we will only be covering 3.3 because that is what um, they don't have. Um, that's what the very current version is. That's what um, Morris Livermore is saying is current version because it's, there isn't a Mac client yet. Um, and um, right now for Polaris, um, all interaction has to be through the visit GUI. The connections to Polaris has to be through the visit GUI because, um, and batch jobs are not currently supported on Polaris. Um, so you can find more information about this and a lot of the information that I'll be covering it, um, will also be updated on this uh, link. So uh, before you actually even connect with Polaris, you need to um, have your machine know about Polaris. So we're gonna, we have to download the Polaris host profile. And right now this profile is only available for Mac and Linux. So um, you'll have to download this file, um, this XML file, and then copy it to your dot visit folder, dot visit slash host folder. And at this point now you're ready to start connecting per Polaris, assuming you you know download and install visit and have this host profile set up. Um, so the first thing you want to do after you open visit is um, set up your host profile. So you want to go to your options menu and there should be a setting called host profiles. There you'll see um, Polaris, which is the profile that you just downloaded. So now, Visit knows about Polaris. You want to go into um, your host settings and you'll see all the settings. But then, since we'll be running on Polaris, we want to use this parallel profile. Um, so you can go to the parallel setting here that there's a tab underneath. It's a settings parallel GPU acceleration. And if you go to parallel, you can change some of the parameters, such as number of parameters. Um, for this example, um, the bank slash account will be ALCF um, underscore training. And then um, the partition slash pool slash Q will be the R122Q that um, Yasi has posted in the chat. Um, but you can change the number of processors and the time um, to specify what you need for the job. Um, but keep PBS node, uh, the PBS underscore node file setting for the machine file as is. So one thing that's useful, obviously, is you know saving these settings, which you can do again from the options um, options menu setting. Um, now, at this point, you're either going to, if you've already used it, you'll be opening a another session, but if you open, just if you want to load data, the first thing you do is you go to um, add and then open a file. So here it automatically will come up with localhost. So you want to make sure that you choose, you, from the drop down button, you choose ANL Polaris, um, in which case a pop-up window will show up and asking you to enter your Polaris uh, password. So you hit OK. And then it will bring up Polaris and you can go to the path and check out which you know, file system you want to retrieve data from. Um, in this case, you know, we're looking at the blood flow tutorial data, which we won't be going over, but this is the data from there. And once you say, um, okay, it'll open up another pop-up button that'll ask you which settings you want and we want parallel um and you can you know double check your settings here it should look okay because you already specified it before in your host profiles you can hit okay um and it may open up this little window that says compute engine launch process this will depend on how backed up the queue is 
Um, for this session, you should be able to connect pretty quickly. Um, but this will kind of cycle until you're actually connected. So then you have, we've um, loaded this artery database and, um, you know, then you can work with it however you need to and come up with your visualization. Um, so that's just kind of a very quick overview of visit. And now I'm going to pass it on to Silvio. who's going to talk about Paraview. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Silvio Ritzi. I'm a computer scientist at ALCF. And I would like to mention that Mark Miller from Livermore, he's one of the developers of uh, VESET uh, as well, is, is here with us. So uh, if if you have any uh, low-level questions or difficult questions, we'll ask him. He will help us for sure. Uh, so uh, Peruvian Polaris, right? Uh, you need to download uh, the client first uh, from the link that we're giving here. Uh, and we have a user guide also posted uh, at the, the documentation site. Um, so the one of one of the things you can do is is check the versions that we have available because your client must match the the version that that you're gonna use, right? So from uh, an SSH uh, session on Polaris, you can just type this command module available pair view. And it will give you a list of those modules available. So with that, you can get the version, right? For the time being, just ignore the, the Mesa uh, suffix. There is that, that is just for our internal purposes. But uh, in, in terms of finding the version that you want to use, I, I recommend uh, 5.11.2 at this point. 5.12.0 uh, release candidate one is available there, but uh, uh, it's, it's not a final version. So. At, at this point, I would recommend that you go with 5.11.2. Uh, next slide, please. And so you, you will need to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, configure the, the server connections, right? So uh, following the, the figures here, there's there's two, two alternative methods of doing this. Either you click on the icon uh, or you click on File Connect. Um, and then if we move to the next slide, uh, the first thing you will need to do is essentially fetch the servers. And in this case, you don't need to download a file like uh, we provided for Visit. And in this case, this uh, these settings are already hosted by Kidware, so you, you can select Polaris at, at ANL. If you're running Windows, uh, you can select the Windows to Polaris at ANL. And that will give you the settings uh, and, and the scripts needed to connect to Polaris. Next, uh, please. So at, at this point, after you download it, uh, the settings you're ready to connect. So click on the on, on, the, on this uh, Polaris at ANL option. Uh, notice that in in this uh, screen capture timeout is set at zero, uh, but that is actually uh, that that is is, is gonna it's likely gonna cause an error. So select a, a timeout value there. I use minus one uh, just to try the default, but uh, also know that it, it takes some time to connect, even in normal, in in, in optimal conditions. Uh, and this is something that that we're uh, trying to figure out with Kidware. Why it takes about a minute in, in some cases to connect. So after you press connect, uh, let's go to the next slide. You will get to this uh, options here in case you're using a Mac. In case you're using Windows, uh, it is it is similar, but you will need to provide an uh, an SSH client, right? So uh, um, let us know if you're using Windows, and and we can uh, point you in the right direction in terms of how to get your SSH client and how to set these parameters. But the the important things that you need to set here are your ALCF username. Uh, and Paraview ver version, if you downloaded the 5.11.2 client, use this value that you're seeing here, 5.11.2-MESA, because this is what, uh, what is actually going to load the module needed to execute. And the module is, is named with the uh, MESA uh, suffix. Then uh, if you're following, if you're doing this now uh, for account, you can use ALCF underscore training. 
And the queue is going to be the number that you see there, which is actually a reservation. If you're doing this later, uh, use your own allocation for account. And uh, for queue, you can use either debug or other of uh, any other of the production queues. Normally, debug is, is the one that has a, a, a best turnaround for short jumps. Let's move to the next slide. And so and you click connect, and now you will get an SSH connection uh, to Polaris. Here you enter your um, crypto key that you get from either your phone application or the physical crypto key, if anyone is still using those. And then you will see this waiting for server connection. And th th this is the point where it may take up to a minute. Uh, so be, be patient. Um, and you, you can actually monitor uh, the state of the queue on a shell on Polaris with QStat, and, and you will see that that your job is in, in running state, but uh, 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 the pair of you is still not getting you to the connected state. And, and something is, is happening there under the hood that, that we need to figure out. Uh, next slide, please. And so when when it's finally connected, you will see this in, 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 your, uh, in your window, right? So you will see the Polaris at ANL there, uh, showing that you are already connected. And now you can use pair of you normally as, as you will normally do, okay? So with this, uh, we conclude uh, our uh, brief uh, refresher, refresher or introduction to Polaris on, um, Pol uh, to, to pair of you on Polaris. And now Joe will continue with uh, some more interesting stuff. Great, so, um... So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the specific data set. Um, and like I mentioned, there we're not going to do a you know a thorough sort of pair view tutorial about you know how to use all the filters and all that. But there is a, fil a, a tutorial on this data that's available on the in the documentation on the AOCF website. There's a link to it there. Um, and and this data set is also available in the well. There's a link in that tutorial so i should say that tutorial is is sort of standalone you don't need cooley for it the rel or sorry polaris for it the size of the data is relatively small so you can just download it and um and use it on your on your workstation or laptop or whatever and there's a link to that data um in the tutorial on that tutorial page um but for our purposes if we're already connected to polaris and we're running pair view as Silvio just demonstrated or you know, showed us, then this is where this data lives. Um, uh, that path there in the in the training project directory, and so for the purposes of of what I want to demonstrate here, I'm going to say let's load. There's there's four different data sets or you know parts to this data set, um, and so I'm going to. Uh, load load all four of them load three of the four of them um this this artery steps and, and you'll notice that um this is a collection of files and so uh on the gui there you can see there's a little arrow and then um if i click that arrow it would, get, it would expand and show me all of the, the files but if i load them as a group um then it'll load all of them as time steps and i'll be able to step through time on all those and all that data Right, and so I'm going to load the artery, the red, the bad, and the good red blood cells. And so if we go to the next slide, and so this is essentially what the default view of that would look like. Um, it's basically a cylinder that has um, some field data on on the mesh of that cell interior and and on the surface of that uh, cylinder. And then there's um, the simulation that this comes from. Um, it's a blood flow simulation that has healthy red blood cells, the good ones, and some that are diseased in some way. I don't recall the specifics. And so we're calling those the bad red blood cells. And so by default, it's going to look like this. If you go to the next slide, um, basically here I'm just saying you know, to change the representation of of those those three data sets. Um, there's the color by uh, drop down um, at the top. Um, and so for the, the, the artery, the cylinder, 
I'm making it white and I'm setting the opacity so that to less than one, so that it's somewhat transparent. So I can now see the blood cells inside and I'm setting the good and the red blood cells to different colors, right? So when you're running and looking at your data, obviously you're gonna potentially add additional filters and, and do all, all the good stuff to set up the pipeline to, to see the view that you want from your data. Um, and so, so this is you know, sort of the short of, of you know, the, glossing over the details of, of that. Um, so now I have a data set with a, a view that I like. And so now if I go to the next slide, there's multiple ways that I can now change uh, save the state for this for this session. And so I could either click on the little icon there with, with the arrow and the disk. Um, and I can now save my state in either two different ways. Um, or I can go to the file menu and say save state. If I save it, and the default is to save it as this dot pvsm. Um, that's a, a state file that it's a sex, essentially um, uh, an XML based, uh, but cryptic, um, you know, not really human readable, but I can then use it to say the next time I, I uh, launch Paraview and I want to look at this same data, I can say load this, this state file, this PBSM. Um, and this is saved on the client side. So it's going to live on your, on your local resource, but it's going to have in the in the file paths, it's going to have all the paths to um, you know to where they live on Polaris. The other way that you can save the state, the process is the same, but now instead of saving it at PV, as a PVSM in order to, to load it back in the GUI, I can save it as a .py, a Python file, um, and this is what I'm going to use for PV batch for um, uh, running Paraview in batch mode. Um, and I'm going to show an example of, of how to do this for, um, I'm going to cycle, cycle over, uh, this particular data set has 100 time steps. And so I'm going to show this short example of how to loop over those time steps and save images for, for each of them. Um, and the, the path that's shown there, the grand projects training, blah, 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 blog tutorial, um, that's the, the, the updated version of the script. Um, so if you want to run it, you can. Again, this script is saved on the client side. So once you edit it, you'll need to move it from your local resource to Polaris in order to actually submit that script to the scheduler. Um, so next slide. So we'll walk through what, what does one of these scripts look like? Um, so here's some code that we're going to add to the beginning of the script. And so um, you may have, uh, you know, in this particular case, I've only got 100 time steps. So to I'm setting total steps to 100. But in cases where you have lots and it's going to take a long time to, to render this, you might want to run um, our, um, oops. I think I, can you guys still hear me? Yes. I'm still okay. hearing you. I can hear you. All right, great. Sorry, I, my I bumped something and I disconnected my something. Okay. Anyway, um, so yeah, so the uh, if I want to be able to say run a segment of the time steps and not all of them at once, right? So I can break it up and I can submit multiple jobs that each renders a different set of frames. Um, so I'm setting it up to say, I'm, I'm going to require to pass in a start frame and a number of frames. Um, and then I'm just defining the directory where I'm going to save all these images and a pointer to the data directory. Now, this isn't strictly necessary. Um, actually, if you go forward one slide for a second, you'll see that for the reader, the readers are is defined in this in the script file, and it has a list of all those time steps, right? So in this case, there's a hundred of them, so it has the full path and all hundred time steps, and it has this for each of the three data sets, right? And so just to kind of clean that up a little bit, so now if you go back one again, right? So I'm going to loop through and create 
a list of files. And then, right, so I have the artery files, the RBC bad, RBC good, and I'm just looping over, um, you know, for however many steps I have and um, appending them to the list, you know, and so I'm creating the, the this list of file names, which now if I go, if you go ahead, a slide, right? So I'm going to replace that and go, uh, no, go ahead, forward. Um, I think one more, does that bring up highlights? Yeah. So, no, yeah, there, sorry. The, so I'm replacing that file name equals and then the big long list with just the, the list of the, you know, instead of spelling it all out, I have a, a list object. And so I'm going to update each of those to be just that list. Um, there's multiple ways that I could do this right now. Um, I have it set to say, set it to the start frame. So I'm only, so I'm not actually going to give it the full list. I'm just going to give it the first time step that I'm going to render. And I do that for each of the three data sets that I'm loading. Okay, if you go to the next slide. Um, so then in between there is all the all the filters that I added and everything else. And I'm skipping up over all of that and then down to the end. And I'm going to set the resolution that I want to save. So there's a couple lines here that says how, you know, setting the resolution and background color. And then I have this for loop where I'm going to loop over the frames that I requested. So starting at the start frame and going for however many frames I told it, I update each of those reader objects to now point to the latest file, the file, the latest file from the list. I create an image file name based on the number, that same number. And then I save screenshot with to that file name using the resolution that I that I defined. So pretty straightforward. Um, and that's the, the the extent I think of what's in that in that script. Um, so if you go to the next, right? So there's multiple ways that I can now run this. Um, if I want to submit an interactive job, I can um, I do a Q sub minus I. Um, hopefully these things, this, this Q sub command looks familiar to you. Um, right, I'm specifying the training project and Q that I want a single node. This, this data is small, so I can run it all on a single node. Um, for an hour, I specify my file systems. Um, once I, I get onto my node, similar to what Silvio did, I run module load pair view to get pair view in my environment. And then I can run PV batch, pass it this script that we um, that we updated, and I pass it a start frame and a number of frames. Right. So I could potentially say instead of saying zero to one hundred, I could run it twice, or I guess in this case I'm on an inter I'm on an interactive node, so I'm going to run it. Um, uh, I'll just run it once sequentially. If I go to the next slide. Um, I can also submit it as a completely as a batch job, right? And so in order to do that, I need a batch, uh, a script that, my, that I'm going to submit to the scheduler. And, and so in that same directory, I have this run PV script. It's just a shell script. And again, and so this is the contents of that, that script. I, I tell it the, the start frame and number of frames. I do my load module pair view, and then I run PV batch. Um, again, this is all the line. It's kind of scroll because of the for spacing, but I run PV batch with the, the path to that script, to the, Py the, the Python script that we were looking at previously. Um, and I give it a start frame and a number of frames. Um, go to the next slide, right? And so now I could submit this job to the scheduler. Um, the process is, you know, similar. I don't have the minus I this time because I'm not going to do an interactive. Um, and at the end, I say dash dash and the, the, the script. And then you'll see this time I'm, I'm running, I'm submitting two jobs. One that's going to render frame zero through 50. And then the next job that's going to start at frame 50 
and render another 50 frames, right? And so now these two jobs, assuming there's nodes available, can run at the same time and I'll finish in half the time, right? And so I can do this um, for, uh, you know, if I have many more time steps, obviously I can keep track of how many steps I'm putting in each, each of these submissions. I can do it, um, have multiple jobs running concurrently um, to, to, to speed up the process. All right, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so now I'm going to give an example of um, of image magic, which we can use as a, as a command line tool for converting, compositing, annotating, doing all sorts of things. Um, and in this example, I'll ask Janet to kind of step through slowly. It's going to highlight different portions. And so if you go ahead, Janet, and forward, right? And so what this is going to do, and obviously I'm glossing over the details, but this is just to show that it can get as complicated as you want. Here I'm going to take four different images and composite them together with a bunch of text and a bunch of other stuff. So if you can step through, that's one image. There's another. Keep going. There's another. Um, and then one left. And so that all of that code was to, to generate this final image. So each of the visualization parts were, was a different image. Each of the the um, the the color bar and the, the text that's on it, all of those things were. That's what those multiple sections were. And so just sort of a a, a tip of you know, sort of best practices. Well, I we tend to do when we're when we are animating generating animations like this is to render the and and I should say that both visit and Pairview have pretty decent tools for adding annotations directly to your visualizations, to like directly to the renderings. Um, I tend to do that as a post processing step, right? So there's lots of times when I might want to use those images for some other purpose. Right, in which case maybe I don't want all the annotations on it. I don't want the scaling happening or whatever. And so I tend to, to as I did in the example that, that I that I showed there, um, is I, I generate a stack of images with no annotations at all, and then I'll go back and generate another stack that adds annotations on top of it, so that um, right, so that I still have the original images if I want to go back to them to use them for some other purpose. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is a quick example of um, if I want to use uh, image magic to, for example, add an annotation that has the time step, for example, right? And so here, I'm similarly, there's a, a module to load image magic. Um, and so I'm saying magic is the convert command, this is the command you use. Um, start with the input image. So that's the, the rendering that I did. I tell it that I'm going to use um, white as the fill color. Gravity, I can set um, essentially where the where the, the where zero zero is. So in this case, I'm setting it to northwest. So that's the upper left corner. And so now when I give coordinates of where I want things to go, it's going to be relative to that point. Um, I'm setting a point size. Here I'm just using the default font, but if I want to use a specific font, there's different options for that. And I'm saying annotate 1515, that's the position, right? So, the, so now that text is going to be 15 pixels over and 15 pixels down. Um, if I didn't mention that, right? And so I said that gravity is northwest, so zero, zero is in the upper left corner, and the positive direction is positive X is to the right, positive Y is down. Um, there's the string I'm going to add. This depth minus eight is to, um, is maybe not strictly necessary, but if we want to subsequently, um, we're going to show, I'll show a command line of how to encode these images. FFmpeg likes them to be 8-bit. And so, um, so I add that to my, to my, image magic command to make sure that they're all the same settings. Um, and then I save the output image. So here's a, a script um, that essentially does this for a stack of images. Um, in, in the case of um, 
uh, in the case of image magic, there's not a bunch of, of libraries and stuff that it needs to load. So really, if I just have the full path to this to Im to the image magic command, that's really all I need. So if I run module load image magic and then say which magic, it'll give me that full path. And so in my script, I'm going to give it that the magic executable is that full path. Similar to the previous ones, I have a start frame, number of frames. In this case, I have an input and an output directory. Um, a font size that you can hard code that, but I happen to put it in a variable. Um, and in this case, I'm going to annotate time. I happen to know that you know, time starts at zero and the time delta is 0.225. And so on the next slide um, is the rest of the script where I just loop from the start frame to however many frames, I generate the time value string, which includes the start time plus the delta times whatever frame I'm on, right? I, I create the input output strings, the name of those frames, and I call this image magic command, similar to what I was doing in, from the command line. Um, and then I make a system call to call it. So this is gonna loop over all of those frames, generate a stack of, a new stack of frames that has the, uh, that has the annotation on it. Next slide. Right, so now I have the stack of frames. Now what do I do, right? So probably want to turn them into a movie. And so we can use FFmpeg to encode them. So similarly, we'll do a module load FFmpeg. And then here's a command for doing, for, for uh, doing that encoding. Um, you'll notice there's a minus R in two places, one at the beginning, and R for rate. And so that's how many frames per second. And so the first one is for the input, the second is for the output, right? So 25 is sort of a standard um, frame rate, but depending on how often your your data was output, right? So maybe that maybe when this the the data was saved, maybe you, your time steps are bigger and so you want to slow things down a little bit. So you can alter the input rate and say, make it 15 or 10 or whatever, and you can still put the output rate at 25. Um, this start number, um, I have it at zero. Uh, that's again, sort of optional. Um, for example, if, you're, if you have uh, segments of movies and they start at different time steps, um, you can tell it what, what frame number to start on. Um, if it's zero or one, um, it'll do, sort of do that. It'll it'll automatically look for zero. If it doesn't find that, it'll look for one. If it doesn't find that, then it's going to complain. And so, um, if you start, you know, at two hundred or something, you could tell it that what number to start at. Um, minus i for input, and then I'm going to give it a format string for what you know. What's the format of my 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 files? Right. So I give it the path. I named them frame underscore and some four digit number. Um, and so I give it that again, the minus the second minus R25 is the output rate. PIX format, we found that YUV420P is, is one that's gives us high quality um, and enables us to then take that file if we want to put it on a web page or something. Um, it's it's that's a, a decent um, encoding to use. And then the MP4 movie file. And so that's how I would encode a movie. 